Start adding new children, etc., etc., um, to the ever growing uh, family tree. Someone, you guys can close three spare chairs here if anyone wants to come and sit down. <laughs> Dale's going to have a bit of a chat, and anybody else who wants to get up and talk about their family, what they're doing, all that sort of stuff, please feel welcome. And uh, Dale and I sat opposite the breakfast table today. We've both sort of written things, one about, I've written about the boys. And what happened to them, Dale's written about Dorothy, who was married to Keith, um, and uh, just about her, and we both burst into tears. And um, <laughs> so this is going to be difficult to discuss for me, um, and I hope it's not too difficult for you. It's a bit of a sad story, of course, because we're celebrating the, the death of um, a couple of blokes, but um, I'll give it a good go. <coughs> Who's Dale? I'm right here. here. There she is. Um, Trying not to look at you. So I'm going to have to read a bit of this because, um, yeah. So yeah, actually, during this discussion with Dale I had today, Dale referred to this as being, you know, the skeleton of the family, and what we're trying to do is now flesh it out. So we hope that some of you will help us flesh it out later on when we've got over this part. Um, and so I start off by saying, and I wrote this before, but I couldn't get here, that our most tangible link with the two boys, Keith and Aubrey, um, is Merle here, who can't be here today, mother of these gorgeous girls, etc., etc. And him? This is her mum. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we know we all... Yeah, 
Mel, yeah, Mel. I, I actually refer to Mel here as the naughtiest of the month. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, she's got Janice, Diane, Craig, Cassandra, and Sonia, and all this mess down here. All this... Buffy and I were going to put rabbits all over the place. But we thought better of it because we were salt supporters. One day I will. Anyway, um, as you know, you're like. I'm going to refer to the notes, so I'm going to go to pieces over all this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Midge, Midge was in between the two boys. Aubrey was born first, followed by Keith, and then Midge. Aubrey and Midge had a special relationship. They were very close, and um, Midge, being Merle's mum, um, meant that this side of the family hold Aubrey particularly close to, the, to their hearts. This guy here, of course, is my grandfather that I never had. And uh, he married Dorothy and yada yada through all this other crowd. Um, these two got together as 23 year olds in Sydney and got married. And the first year of the marriage, they had Aubrey. The next year, they had Keith. And the next year they had Nancy, uh, no, Marjorie. And then the family started to fall apart. And within seven years they were divorced. <clears throat> and Nellie went on to marry a Murray and the rest of that is. What I'm trying to do is relate a timeline as to what happened to these guys. In the early childhood of the three muttons was far from ideal. They were the product of these two Sydney siders, Harold Mutton and Nellie Watts, who at age 23 got themselves hooked up in 1890. Aubrey was born the year following the marriage, Keith the next year, and Marjorie the year after that. The marriage lasted less than seven years and they divorced with Nellie getting custody of the three children, her then were age six, five, and four. The kids were put into orphanages by Nellie, who traveled to Kargoorlie where she met and married Matthew Murray within a year of the divorce. It's not clear exactly what happened, but it appears that Marjorie had a very bad time in the orphanage, as kids did in those days, and that Nellie's parents took her out and looked after her. She was recorded, I found a record of her being a passenger on board the SS Victoria at the age of five from Sydney, so obviously <coughs> Nellie sent for her. And Nellie, and she was she went from Sydney to Albany in a boat called the SS Victoria. Matt and Nellie were married and were living in Albany because they had an eight-month-old child uh, and who was very sick, and she died in Albany. Very soon after that, Nancy arrived aboard the SS Victoria. The two boys were still in orphanages in Sydney, and, and I don't know exactly when they came to Western Australia, but they were certainly there in November 1899 because I had the receipts. <clears throat> I've often wondered when Matt got, you know, got, got to learn that his relationship with Nellie meant that he, had a, he, he inherited a family of three <laughs> under the age of um, six. Uh, seven, under the age of seven. But whatever, it didn't deter him because Nellie and he then went on to have in their first year um, uh, Nancy, I think Nancy first, was it? No. Faith. Faith. Point uh, is, Hannah Merle. No, no, first, first this one, I think. And, and, then, and then the next year, Faith. Yeah. So actually, that boy had weird names. Like, how in the world is this Nancy? Faith, actually, they called Faith Faith. So, um, in the intervening years, the family farmed in Wandered Hills, where Dorothy and Keith actually met. Um, and then they eventually moved to Perth, where Matthew 
created a, a business for himself in what was then um, the latest invention, the home refrigerator. And he became a refrigeration service man. And uh, it was in the very early days of refrigeration in Perth. Apparently, according to Dale, Grandma used to always boast about the fact that she had one of the first refrigerators. <laughs> I thought that was Matt's video message. That mum said that he had the first yeah, refrigeration. No, so he must have been, because he was married yeah. to Faith. Yeah. That's right. So, um, by 1916, Aubrey, who was a poet and a, and a mathematician, um, was working as a school teacher. He was at Hale School at that stage. He had been at other schools, but he was at Hale School. Um, and Keith was studying to be an Anglican priest. He had done two years of his training and had been given um, a parish. Um, he was uh, working at the Cloisters in Perth. It was the same year that the two boys, 1916, that these two young men signed up. The war had been going for two years at that stage um, and had been consuming thousands of lives. And there was huge pressure on young men like them to sign up to go off to defend the Empire and, and the Allies in Europe. Aubrey listed first in January 1916 and uh, after undergoing officer training in Duntroon, he embarked for France in that December. Keith, enlist Keith enlisted in February of 1916, a month after Orb. Because he was a young priest, he didn't want to be a, in combat, a combat soldier, so he signed up for non-combatant duties and was initially trained, as you can see by his Red Cross, as a medico, um, but later he received training as a signaller. In the August, Dorothy and Keith married, and two days before Christmas that year, they farewelled Audrey, Aubrey off to France. A few weeks later, in early 1917, Dorothy discovered she was pregnant. And at the end of June, Keith left for the war. She was about five months pregnant, I think, then. With our father. With our father, mm -hmm. Keith. At the same time, Aubrey, about the same time, Aubrey arrived in France and was marched off to Belgium sometime later to become involved in it was one of the most horrendous battlefields of the war. There are some really mysterious things about, about Aubrey that you know, Merle talks about a lot and, you know, in his time in France, he struck up a relationship with a young woman there who wrote to... He, who wrote to um, Marjorie, um, sent photographs, and we don't quite know what it was all about. And unfortunately, all that has been lost somewhere or misplaced. Another real mystery to this man is that he, in his will, he left 10, 10 pounds, which is a lot of money in 1917, to a woman in South Australia that nobody knows who she was. <laughs> Doreen May. And Midge was his executor of his will and the beneficiary of the rest of, of his money. But she never ever told Merle about this woman. And I only discovered it recently when I found his will. So, so you know, no, 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 the only Dorian May I can find was a concert hall singer in, in, in Adelaide. That sounds like a button thing. <laughs> Sobriquets or something like that. What's the word, Mona? What's the yeah? Sobriquet. Yeah, she was very And there's lots of related, lots of references to her. So I don't know what, what that was all about. And Nicole Kidman in My Rouge was referred to as a sobriquet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. So you can get the picture. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, just want to keep this light. Um. Aubrey died in the first battle of Passchendaele. Um, it was a campaign in which um, half a million men were killed or injured in a few months. 38,000 casualties were Australians. Um, 
I won't go into what Passion Day was all about, but it was a crazy event. Um, on one day, on the day that um, on the day that Aubrey was killed, they were trying to take a railway line, and there had been huge rains, and the Australians became hopelessly bogged down, and were forced to retreat, um, and they lost much of the ground that they had gained in the previous days. Aubrey was severely wounded on October the 12th and while being carried out of the field um, by two German prisoners of war on a stretcher, um, a shell hit the three of them and they were killed instantly. Um, Orb's body was never recovered. Um, probably the Australians retreated back from where he was hit at the time. And um, that's why uh, he was never found. And back home, the news filtered through to Nellie. She was 51 years old. Midge was 24. And the two girls were 16 and 17. A few weeks later, Keith Jr. was born to Dorothy. Keith's son. That was November 7, 1917. It takes until December the 1st that Keith hears that, his fa that he is the father of a little boy. At that stage, he was being trained in Britain as a signaller. In a letter to Dorothy that night, he reveals... Right near Salisbury Cathedral. Oh. Well, that next door to Salisbury Cathedral, where the... But the Russians were... poisoned the... Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, it was oh. right, yeah, it was about five k's out of Salisbury, yeah. Bastards. <coughs> just, um, to, just to locate it. <laughs> yeah. In a letter to Dorothy... So it took from November 7 to December 1 for the news to filter through. In a letter to Dorothy that night, he reveals his love and joy at the news going on for absolute pages, maybe 10 pages of, of pencil written, um, both sides of the paper. Um, we have the, all these letters, by the way. I'll just read you a bit of it. It's really over the top. Mother of mine and little son of mine, I feel as if I could jump over the moon tonight and so happy am I afraid that something may happen to spoil my joy. Receive the most joyful news today. Unto you is born a son. My own, our own little son, our God sent blessing, mother of mine, words fail me to tell all the love and tenderness that goes out miles over the ocean to you both tonight. When will God grant me a return to you both? It actually goes on for a lot more, but I can't really read it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that does us all. <laughs> he, um, he then. He then actually gives a clue as to why he signed up further down in the letter towards the end. He says, to the one unfortunate day when duty called to the other side of the world, a stern duty, and yet I were not worthy of your true woman's love had I disobeyed that call. I were not capable of being that father to my son that I want to be and I, had I failed in that supreme sacrifice. God called me Kitty. And God will, in his good time, bring me home to you and my own little son. A few weeks later, Keith is told that somebody called Murray, with similar initials to all, he believed had been killed in Belgium. Keith writes off the uh, Red Cross. And on January the 8th, he gets confirmation that Rob's dead. In the May of that year, Keith is sent to France and writes his first letter home from somewhere in France. It's one of the many beautiful letters that um, Dorothy, um, to Dorothy that barely touch on the horrors around him. As time goes by, he becomes more optimistic that the war fortunes are changing and that he will be home to see Dorothy and Keith Jr. He, he wrote often. They wrote back and forth together quite a lot and the, the letters to Dorothy are still in existence. 
and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> On September 15, today. 1918, 100 years today, Keith penned his last letter from France. Um, he had just received photographs of his little boy and he writes a letter with a sort of a rather foreboding ending. Dearest wife and my own little son, received three more of your welcome letters yesterday, the latest being July 9. I'm getting quite a lot of them lately, but would sooner do without the need for them, greatly as usual. Your photographs are tip top, just a little out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> Still, they are really good for a brownie. <laughs> Keith Owen is certainly some bonny kid, and I long to see the little chap and hold him in my arms and hear his baby prattle, no less his dear mother. He talks about the countryside around there, and I know exactly where he is because he's in Hespacor, and it's a beautiful place. But anyway, he, got, he finishes the letter by saying, God be with you, kitty mine, in your hours of anxious watching and waiting, and, so, and soon reunite us, till death us do part, and then only inform, for love is eternal, there beyond the grave. God bless you, and keep you, dearest woman. Three days uh, later, on September 18, the objectives for the Australians was to take the little village of Villarette. Villarette was one of the villages that had been fortified by the Germans as they um, retreated to um, their original line of the war. Um, the tide of the war was changing and uh, Keith and many others believed that the end was in sight. On that day, while uh, making their way along the road that leads from the tiny one-town road of Hesbacore to Villarette, just a short distance across these paddocks, the shell exploded and Keith fell mortally wounded, along with two other men. It was just 54 days before the armistice and the last day that Keith's battalion saw action. The very next day they were relieved by the Canadians and did not see action again. Keith only had to survive that one day. So, <coughs> the rest of it, yeah, the rest of it, I guess we've lived, and um, uh, that was the story of the boys. I'm sorry it's a sad story, but um, that's the way it is. Um, I think Dale might like to say a few words. Right. If she can. <laughs> <laughs> So when it came to talking about sort of fleshing this out a bit, I wanted to flesh out our grandma, um, Keith's, Keith's wife um, and the, the uh, mother of our father. Um, and this, I suppose I particularly want to do this because all through this period that Australia's been commemorating um, the, the First World War, um, sort of battle by battle, it's felt like, going. Um, I've been really conscious of the fact that there's been really little um, talked about the women who, who continued on life, I suppose, um, and what they were going through and what they went through. And um, so I just sort of thought in commemorating this, I'd like to actually commemorate my grandmother who I'm now going to start to cry about. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that became really, really clear to me uh, recently is when uh, um, Sam and, uh, and um, Rosie were having uh, their little Millie, who's a month old now, um, and, uh, and Millie weighed uh, quite heavily. Um, which quite a lot of our babies have changed. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that... Nine pounds four. <laughs> and I've said a very 
very quick text back saying that was nothing. <laughs> nothing Try again. <laughs> quite a few of us have weighed that. Um, my father, uh, I know, weighed over 10 pounds, and that, which made me think to myself, Grandma... 10 pound palms. Yeah. Grandma um, had been living in Meriden. She came to Perth to give birth. She told me that she had no idea how she would actually give birth. Nobody had ever told her. Oh, um, she uh, um, gave birth alone. No husband, like um, Sam was there with, with uh, Rosie, but um, no husband and gave birth to a ten, over 10 pound baby alone. And I guess that a lot of those women did exactly that. Um, but Grandma did go on to live a very full life. Um, she, uh, she lived next door to us the whole time we were growing up, so, so we were very, very close to her. Um, and um, she was a school teacher for 33 years. Um, she put Dad through uh, Guildford Grammar School right from a very early age because he, she felt that he needed to be around men. Um, she never remarried. And it's terrific that we are actually in Fremantle doing this because, in fact, the only three months of proper marriage that Grandma ever had was in, in East Fremantle because um, Keith was sent to Fremantle Hospital um, to, before he was shipped out to, um, to do some training as a medic. And uh, Grandma got a, um, a room in a house in, um, in East Fremantle and they had that three months together um, <clears throat> before he got on a ship in Fremantle. Um, so it's really nice that we're all in that area. I don't know if this is East Fremantle. Is it? No. 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 Yeah, it was East Fremantle, yes. Um, so... She was a terrific grandmother to us. She was a scary woman. Um, a lot of people say that about her, and I think that Merle sometimes says grandma was pretty scary. Um, I know Max Finnegan thinks that she was pretty scary. Um, and, um, but to us, she wasn't. Uh, Paul had a particularly close relationship to grandma because when we went to live in Guildford and we took over her house, and she went to England on long service leave in 1952. And, uh, and um, Mum and Dad built a cottage for her next door. And while she was gone, she came back and moved into it. Paul was a toddler at the time and spent endless hours with Grandma. But I spent a lot of time with her after school. I used to go into her place and listen to the Argonauts. I had full use of the radio um, at that time and, uh, and she would always make dates with marzipan in the middle of them for, for afternoon tea. Um, and she was still alive to attend my wedding. Um, she came to Esperance in 1973, I think it was, and stayed with us on the farm for a while. And, um, and then she died in 1975 at the age of 83. She was still as sharp as a tack. She'd been up to the house, mum and dad's house in uh, Kalamunda, had um, absolutely killed the family with a um, quiz that they did. She knew all the answers. She was very clever. And um, went home and had a stroke and died within 24 hours. So it was a good end for her. Um, and um, she'd been remained very independent all of her life. So that's Dorothy. Good. Uh, now, I also wanted to tell you, well, there are two other things I wanted to tell you. I'm wearing her peach brooch today. She gave me that at some point when I was probably in my 20s or something and told me she was a pacifist um, when she gave it to me. So I'm wearing that. And um, the books there of Beloved Teacher are written by my dad. Um, they are available for anyone to take a copy because I've actually inherited a box. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell them away. It's a strange book, but it's, um, it does have a sort of a storyline 
that relates to all of this and uh, a lot of photos and so on. So anybody that hasn't got a copy, probably quite a few of you have seen it. But it's there. If any of you want one, <coughs> just take it. Will you sign it as the, uh, the closest... The <laughs> 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 it means it means someone will take it. I'm sure. Yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> 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 I'm happy for them to go. Everyone wants to have a chat about it. Come up here and talk about it. Like we we can get on some, some interesting stuff like adding new children, etc. Into the uh, and family tree. Um, yeah, we can yeah. be nice yeah. if we yeah. heard yeah. from yeah. anybody yeah. who yeah. wants to talk about any aspects of themselves, their family, or. I've got a question. Maybe Buffy could tell us. What is your name? Oh, Kim. Oh, yeah. Why did Nelly choose to go? Shut up. It's a mystery. Um, you just ask questions. Well, what was the question? Why did Nelly go? She. The Gold Rush course is on, you know, and Kagali is. A spot. I don't know where she's going looking for a bloke or what, but you know, uh, <laughs> Daddy's book says that there, there are several stories. One is that she had a sister who had a tea rooms in Kargoolie and she went over there. No, it's a good story. She That's came across with the sister yes. to start the tea rooms. There is a, That's yeah, a story. That is a story as well. I heard she came across with a tea room to start a sister. There are, yeah, so there are two things. I can actually find no reference anywhere to her having a sister. But that's not unusual because often people weren't registered in those days. Yeah, I can't find any of hers either. No. I wasn't sure what Nelly was short for as well. Yeah, she's hard to find. Yeah, she's really hard to find. The what's. Also, you know, Dad refers to her father, who's got the. Yeah, her dad, as Joshua. But I think his name wasn't Josh, I think it was something else. And there were several Watsons around then. Yeah. One of them was a rat bag who was a convict, yeah. Joshua. And then there's another one. So I don't know which one he was. Well, so the whole, it's a mystery. She's a mystery, I reckon. Well, Mum referred to her as the old bitch, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mum also talks about Nellie's mother owning, a, being, I don't know if she owned it, but um, a woman's emporium in Rose Bay in Sydney. And so she made bonnets. When Nana went to the, the orphanage and they shaved her big blonde ringlets off because she got nits like all the other children and put kerosene on her head, that her grandmother, so Nellie's mother, made bonnets with big yellow ribbons and things to cover her shaved head. Oh, so right. that Nana hated the Catholic Church and nuns because in the, in the children's uh, girls' orphanage that she had went to, she was humiliated and she went to bed and she was spanked in front of other children and the boys used to come across on the ferry from their orphanage on a Sunday and bring her a gingerbread man. 